this, this afternoon in our Men in the Word class, we were talking about the life of David and the fact that uh, although David messed up so many times, so many times, um, how he was still called a man after God's own heart, we kept asking why is that. Um, and we just talk, talked about the compassion of God, um, how he sees us, not who we are, but he sees us in the light of his son, Jesus, um, in the compassion of his son, in the perfection of his son. So as we sing this uh, song, as we begin our time of worship, and we're just talking about laying down everything at the cross, um, there's a place where mercy reigns and never dies. And this is where Christ died for our sins so that we would be made justified in him. So why don't you stand, church, as we sing this together.
It's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing with me. Evening come. Bless the Lord. Bless the you agree that he is worthy of that? Amen. In every circumstance, and every trial, uh, he is worthy of that worship. Let's sing this together. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's day. And sinners plunge
Be seated. How about Numbers 11? Take your Bibles and let's turn there and study God's Word tonight together. Another challenging chapter. (laughs) Father in heaven, we thank you for your redeeming love. I pray, Lord, that would be our theme here at Riverbend. We would be driven by love of our Lord. His love for us, our love for Him, our love for one another. Lord, cause that to be our theme, Lord. What a great message that is. Thank you for your word, Lord. Thank you for the history of the nation of Israel. Thank you that it's written on the pages of Scripture, inspired by the Spirit of God, laid down for us to study and to learn by, Lord. We're grateful for an opportunity to see those who made sinful mistakes, Lord, to learn by them, Lord, so we don't repeat them. Cause us to love you. Have a grasp of that redeeming love so we don't repeat what others have, Lord. Lord, we thank you for this time. We pray for those who are not well, Lord. We know there's numbers of people who are sick, and we just pray you'd heal them quickly, Lord, and return them to us, Lord. Give them strength, Lord. Give us all strength when we suffer through trials and testing. Cause us to lean on you more. In Jesus' name, amen. Entitled the sermon, The Graveyards of the Faithless on the Way to the Promised Land. Um, We've already seen some of the graveyards as uh, they worship the golden bull calf. But from here on out, we will see graveyards for 40 years with the nation of Israel. There will be a constant rejection of God, a sinful rejection of God, and the wages of sin will be death. And we'll see that over and over. And in this section here, we'll see that the children of Israel have now left. They're on their way to, uh, quote, the promised land. They're working from Sinai to Kadesh Barnea. And along the way, these difficulties start to arise, and they challenge the people And the people, instead of turning to God for help, they begin to complain. And this chapter begins the recording of what I would call um, a complaining spirit that made its way into the congregation of the nation of Israel. 
And it continues all the way through chapter 14. And in there we'll see they reject the word of God, the promise of God, and they are turned around from the border. The nation began to grow in this spirit of discontentment. You could call it that as well. And we see it by the consequences and the murmuring against Moses and the Lord. And it brings about death and punishment. And certainly the travel in the wilderness is not easy. It's not hard to, to look at what they were doing, how many people they were, how far they had to go. I've showed you pictures of some of that land. This is a large nation moving through a very difficult environment. But it was not merely that the people complained once or twice. And here's my point tonight. It's that there was the fact that there was this developing within them a complaining spirit. I think there's a real difference because there's days we have like, oh, Lord, I don't like this. And we may have some difficulties with things that are going on. And we may not always handle them right the first shot at it. But then we'll come back and say, oh, Lord, I'll trust you. There's a difference in a complaining spirit. A complaining spirit grips somebody. They remain locked in that complaining spirit. And then from there, they begin to spiral away from the truth of God. Now, the climax of this, climbing, this complaining spirit will come at Kadesh, Marnia. And right at the time where they needed to trust the Lord the most, they're on the border, the spies have been sent, the spies have returned, that complaining spirit will take them where they should not go. And that's what sin does. It takes us to places we had no desire to go in even at times. This would cost them 40 years. Cost them 40 years in the wilderness. And they'll die there. The whole generation will die and not be allowed to enter into the promised land. Well, there's strong lessons, of course, for here. And one of, one of them is this generation is not just suddenly lost. And it's something I thought deeply about. It's just not suddenly lost. They didn't all of a sudden say, oh, we just made a mistake. I think what we'll see is they prove themselves to be disqualified as true followers of God. They reject the God whom they say they follow. And God's going to expose that. And it starts in these passages with this complaining spirit that exposes their heart, shows that they're incapable of following this divine calling that God has. And there's a lot of lessons that a lot of people hang around Christianity. And we're going to see that today. There's the... uh, what he calls the rabble, right? The mixed group that was with them. They hang around to the people of God, but they're really not the people of God. Let me give you several thoughts tonight on this text. Number one, a complaining spirit in the judgment of God. Look at the first three verses with me. Now the people became like those who complained of adversary in the hearing of the Lord. And when the Lord heard it, his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed the outskirts of the camp. The people therefore cried out to Moses, and Moses prayed to the Lord, and the fire died out. So the name of that place was called Taberna, because of the fire, because of the fire of the Lord burned among them. Now, there's a lot of details that are absent here of what exactly happened, but I think it comes down to the nation's murmuring here. And it points to the fact that there was a general complaining spirit. So there's not a lot of details here, but it says this has been their spirit. This is the way they are. They're generally complaining. They are losing their trust in God, and they are complaining. Again, certainly this was not an easy trip. We want to make sure we, we understand that. But God was leading them. He was providing for them. He was doing it miraculously. He was a cloud by day and a pillar by night. These were phenomenal uh, uh, Views of God, in a sense, right? A cloud over them and a pillar leading them and giving them manna to eat. He was providing for them. But whatever the nature of their complaint is, because it doesn't tell us in verse 1 there, it brings on a severe, notice this, displeasure of the Lord and fire of some sort rains down upon the outskirts of the camp. Now, this tabernacle, name that they gave here we see in verse 3 here it it the word means a place of burning in verse 1 it says that the fire of the lord came down right so this 
tells us not only that it came uh, from where it came from, but even the Hebrew word, I, look, I started chasing that down to see where all the places it was used. It's, it's the idea of this blazing, flashing, fiery flames. This was intense. God is not happy with this complaining spirit that is among his people. It's clear that the whole camp did not suffer. Verse 2 says that Moses quickly interceded for them and, and the Lord stopped that and the fire burned out. And it seems possible that the Lord's judgment was sent just to manifest his power, to remind them, hey, complainer, look what I can do. It's, it's not one of the stronger plagues that come that wipes out thousands. It seems to be quick and takes some out, but it's a warning. It's, it's trying to remind them that I can manifest my power at any time. I'm, I'm in front of you as a pillar of fire at night, and I can destroy some complainers. And I think God is trying to awaken the nation to be fearful of a holy God and His majesty here. As a result... Of these passages and studying this, I, I began to think, well, I'm not sure what, the, what would they actually were complaining about here. I think we'll see a little more as it develops here. But what's clear is God has this divine plan, and he will have it his way. <laughs> no matter how much we stick our heels in the ground, he, he has a sovereign plan. He, he's, the Bible tells us in Ephesians 1 that he has brought it about through the kindness of his, of his will, right? Of his divine will. And so because of this, he, he wants his people to follow him. And I, and I thought a little more about this. I thought, man, somewhere in that nation is the seed of Christ. And, and so there's tremendous love and patience despite his discipline here because his goal is redemption of his elect down through the ages. And so God will often do things to wake his people up from their complaining spirit. All that God does with the nation of Israel and with us, I would say as well, we must understand that God's eternal plan and kindness of his will won't be stopped even by rebellion. He's still going to have his way. Now, I think that's the love of God, right? That he does his will despite us at times. But he will correct. He will discipline. He'll even bring judgment on those who don't know him because he knows what is best and he's going to fulfill this divine plan. Now, notice in verse 1 that you don't want to miss this that the Lord is listening it says when the Lord heard it he, he's listening the psalmist says he's attentive his ear is attentive to us and so that's part of his holy character he listens to us but he also reacts to sin he's a holy God now there's fascinating things that went on in this this fire and stuff, but that happened at the cross as well, man. Think about at the, at the cross when Christ is dying. The Bible says the earth shakes. There were flashes of lightning. The earth opened up. And all this is happening while God is pouring his wrath and judgment on his son because of our sin. And so we see God remind us of his power and authority and his really hatred towards sin. And this is no exception, this passage as well. I love the intercessory work of Moses here. But it's just a dim shadow, right? Moses will see him really struggling to, to really care for this difficult flock. Um, but Moses is a, a dim shadow compared to the bright and glorious intercessory work of the Lord Jesus Christ that he does for us, right, on our behalf. And we see him in, in chapter, uh, verse 2 here where Moses cries out and Moses prays and the people go to him. They, they know that he is the one who goes to the Lord. And so there's this role of this intercessory. And, and Moses is really a dim picture of the true intercessory. And so we run to the Lord. He hears our prayers and intercedes for us. I think it's fascinating that here in the wilderness, there is a place where the fire of the Lord marked. I mean, they even named the place that. But to me, when I think about markings on this world... I find it humbling and I find it marvelous that there's a place on this earth where Jesus Christ came and died there. Now, I don't want to build a church on top of it like they've done and all those kind of things. That's not what I'm talking about. 
I think it reminds me of how much the Lord loves me. That he would send his son, his son would take on flesh. He would actually be on this earth, not in some spirit form. He was physically here. He physically died. And there was a place on this earth that marked the judgment of God on my, for my behalf. There's a place there. And some people like to travel to some of these places and see it. And it's, it's quite emotional when you get to some of the places where God might have been. I, I knew I found myself with great emotions on Mount Sinai. Uh, a few months ago, thinking about Moses and his relationship with God there. But, but there's no reason to build churches or anything on top of that. The fact is, it just tells us that God loves us so much that he would actually be engaged with people in such a way. I think there's a physicality and a reality that is both so, uh, sobering and worshipful to think that my Lord was on this earth and he walked streets and he interacted with people and he cared for souls and he rebuked the wicked and then he made his way to a cross and and everything was against him every, every i mean the whole world and all the enemy forces were against him but nothing would stop him because that's the divine will of god second thought there's a sinful influence that exposes the heart here in verses four through nine listen along as i read the rabble who were among them had greedy desires and also the sons of Israel wept again and said, Who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish that we used to eat free in Egypt. The cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and garlic. But now our appetite is gone. There is nothing at all to look at except this manna. Now the manna was like a coriander seed. And its appearance was like a bellium. The people would go about and gather it and grind it between two millstones and beat it into a mortar and boil it in pots and make cakes with it. And its taste was the taste of cakes baked with oil. And when the dew fell on the camp at night, the manna would fall with it. Well, here we have the next recording of the murmuring against God that immediately follows this this striking of fire on the outskirts of the camp. And the judgment that's seen in verses 1 and 3 certainly suggests that there was strong unbelievers uh, and faithless group that was there. And they seem not to have a regard for the discipline of God. So this... This, this is evident, right? There's, 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 the Bible says there's these rabblers there and their greedy desires is affecting Israel and God sees this and he strikes the outskirts of the camp. These are insights into faithless followers of God. There's always those who hang around, right? Judas hung around a long, long time, didn't he? Till the night before his death. That's how long Judas hung around. There's always those who claim they're in their faith or want to be in some kind of religious atmosphere that hang around until eventually their flesh cannot restrict them anymore to pursue their desires. We see this all the time. People who are caught in immorality, they know how to put a great face on for a while, but sooner or later that cannot hold up. Eventually that comes out and eventually their sins find them out. I imagine that the incident in the first three verses caught the attention of Joshua and Caleb. <laughs> they are the only two who are going to believe God, right? When it comes to the border. They're the only ones who are going to believe and they're going to go on to be, have a place in the promised land. But for the rest, it seems that there is an accumulative effect on them, this complaining spirit that now has a grip on the nation just Hours or days from leaving Mount Sinai where the Lord was on the mount and now he's leading them by a pillar and by a cloud, this, this complaining spirit is making its way through the congregation. Certainly one of the sinful influences of the nation was what the Bible calls here, notice in verse 4, the rabble, or maybe your Bible might say the mixed multitude. It's only used here, um, this particular word, um, and they're traveling with the nation of Israel. And they would have traveled and they would have dwelt on the outskirt of camp. I, saw, I showed you a slide last week where they would have been probably in the tail end, is what we believe, 
Um, and then they would not have been in the tribes. They were not part of the tribes, so they would have had to camp outside of the tribes. And so it, it seems to think that it's where God struck this. And it seems obvious that these rebel rousers, as the Bible refers to him, are helping spread a discontentment through the camp. But it isn't hard to read this verse, particularly verse 4, and you begin to realize that the sons of Israel wept again. They're responsible for this. They have a responsibility, and though the mixed multitude, these rabble people, are influencing them, they know what God did for them, and yet they have forgotten that. There are those that will come among our midst that will often have a distaste for God. And we have to be careful of them. There are wolves that are coming in sheep's clothing at times. But here, this distaste for the provision of God is, is very unsettling, right? You're out in the middle of nowhere, and, and when you're there, you just get overwhelmed with how do you feed two million people out here? How do you get water? Everything is going to have to be miraculously supplied for them. There's no other way. And you'll see what Moses says later. He goes, you know, we kill all the animals and catch all the fish. We still couldn't do this. So everything had to be miraculous. And yet they looked at that provision, this miracle of heaven's food falling down to them as, ah, we're tired of this already. And this caused this spirit of discontentment. We see that in verse 6. But now our appetite is gone. Look at the statement here. There's nothing at all to look at except this manna. I mean, you can almost picture them. They, they have it there and they're... Poof. Completely ungrateful for... Living in the wilderness, I mean, you want to go set you out in the wilderness in Nevada and just, I'll just drop you off in some places where I know you're not going to make your way home for weeks. <laughs> You'd be loving to have a couple little crackers with you, wouldn't you? But yet that's what discontentment does, right? It grows. Furthermore, they were allowed to complain. They were allowed their complaining spirit to lead them back to the things of Egypt. Look at this. This is, this is amazing. Verse 5, we remember the fish which we used to eat in Egypt, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. Their, their complaining spirit is now figuratively leading them back to slavery. That's quite a statement, isn't it? So you would think that Israel would have not forgotten the terrible conditions of slavery, the death they witnessed there, the misery of life for hundreds of years. You would think that the recognition of God's divine calling to them personally as a nation of Israel, to call them and them alone out of that nation, to redeem them, to rescue them from such destituteness, it would create a lifetime gratitude, right? No, they, they're actually looking back to a hellish experience and looking at it as paradise, I think that's what verse 5 says. We remember the fish and the cucumbers and the melons. They're looking at the hellish experience of Egypt, of being a slave, as paradise now. That's where a complaining spirit will take you. It'll twist your thinking so bad, and pretty soon you'll be so far out there and drug away from what God intends for you. The evil influence, this rabble in verse 4, they were stronger to them than the word of God, right? God told them, I'm giving you this manna. It's to sustain you because I want it to sustain you till I get you to a land flowing with what? And what does that mean? That means a land full of fertile ground. It's some of the most fertile ground in the world even to this day. Just... Take my food from heaven for a short bit to get you through this very difficult terrain and cross there, and I will bring you into a place that is so fertile you can't even imagine it. That's the goodness of God, and yet a complaining spirit will not see his blessing, will it? Instead, they let the faithless lead them into discontentment. They let the rabble-rousers, the, the mixed 
congregation, the ones that are still holding to Egyptian gods and other things, lead them away. And this complaining spirit ultimately led them to reject God's word. Notice in verse 7 through 9, we have this explanation of what God was giving them. And it's just like, like they're sitting around eating crackers all day. They got cake. <laughs> I think that's pretty cool. It gives you an idea that they became creative with this. And, and it was a sustainable uh, nutrient for them to get them to this promised land. The description of manna provided helps you realize they knew how to use this. The psalmist talks about it. Psalm 78, 22 through 25 says this, because they did not believe in God and did not trust in his salvation, yet he commanded, yet he did this for them. He commanded the clouds above and he opened the doors of heaven and he rained down manna upon them to eat and he gave them food from heaven. Man did eat the, the bread of angels and he sent them food in abundance. See, the psalmist, now as they look back at the fall of Israel there, they knew that God was being gracious to them. And of course, all this points forward to the Lord Jesus, right? He is the bread of life, John chapter 6. Listen to what he says to those who opposed him, verse 32, following Jesus, therefore said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who, get, who gave you bread out of heaven, but it was my Father who gives the true bread out of heaven. Now, all oh, it's turning to him. I'm... I'm the true sustaining, eternal sustaining spiritual nutrient that you need. Verse 33, for the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven. So all of that manna was a picture of, of Christ coming, right? And he even gives himself that title, I am the bread of, God, the bread of God. And he goes on to say, and I give life to the world. If they don't have that manna, they don't even get, a, they don't even get out of the desert, do they? They're, they're done for. Jesus goes on to say, or they, they say to him in verse 34, Lord, evermore give us this bread. They just want their tummies full. They don't see that he is their spiritual nutrient. And Jesus says to him, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I say to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. See, when you don't learn from the sins of others, you're just going to repeat it, right? We have that saying in history. If we don't learn from history, we're bound to repeat it. And it's very true. That's the way sin works. There are, are those that look at manna and disdain it, right? We see this. They're disdaining this thing. And there are those who look at Christ and disdain him, didn't they? There are those who were grateful for the provision of manna. And there are those, some of them, that looked at Christ and worshipped him. There were those who tasted the heavenly food and it's sweet and it's sweet, satisfying to their soul. And there's those who taste it and say, ah, it's bitter, I don't want it. And pride keeps them from coming to the Lord Jesus. Third thought, God and his intercessor are in agreement. This is a little fascinating section here. Look at verse 10 with me. Now Moses heard the people weeping throughout the, their families each man at the doorway of his tent. A complaining spirit is sweeping through the nation. This is what's happening here. This is why we have to be so careful. We know that our attitudes as parents affect our, parent, our children. Um, I mean, this is just the way it works, right? Sin has a, has a way of moving through a group of people. And the anger of the Lord was kindled greatly, and Moses was displeased. I think it's a real key to understand this. this. This scene is not being missed. Both Moses and God are seeing what's going on here. And, and we have to ask the question, is Moses wrong or sinful in his response here? I think the word and, um, as I looked at this, at first I thought, well, maybe Moses is not happy with what God's doing. No, the, the word and connects these thoughts to say that the anger of the Lord was kindled greatly and Moses as well was displeased with these people. And I think you see as he comes and petitions the Lord, we see what happens here. Look at verse 11, this divine rant of Moses. So Moses says to the Lord, why have you been so hard on your servant? 
Why have I not found favor in your sight that you have laid the burden of this people on me? I think it's a divine rant. I think sometimes we all have these, and I don't think they necessarily have to be sinful. I think there's a non-sinful way of bringing our struggles to the Lord. Many times I've said, Lord, I don't understand what you're doing here. (laughs) This is hard for me to get my mind around this difficult circumstance, why you've allowed this to happen. It's not questioning God's authority. It's questioning him because I'm I'm flesh and blood and I don't understand his ways at times. We see the psalmist, David particularly, um, really plead with God and question God at times. That's a different scenario than coming to him in a sinful way. I think there's just the reality of the situation. There's 600 men on foot, the Bible will tell us here in a moment. That's 600 warriors and all of their families. So there's at least 2 million people that are here um, ready and needing food and are complaining. And this spirit of, of disunity and dissatisfaction is now sweeping through this. Notice in verse 12, he says, this is an amazing statement. Was it I who conceived all these people? Was it I who brought them forth that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a nurse carries a nursing infant to the land which you swore to their fathers? Now, this is just an absolutely fascinating verse. In the midst of Moses' divine rant, we discover this depth of who God is, the character of God out of this. Moses begins to say, did I conceive these people? It's rhetorical, isn't it? God conceived these people. I mean, right there, there's so much things we could talk about. Everything from abortion to conception to fertilization to to God's control of all that stuff, isn't it? I mean, it's all right there. Moses said, I didn't do this. Notice what he says. Was it I who brought them forth? I didn't birth these people. Again, tells you of the power and the sustaining and uh, the character of God to, to produce a people. Abraham, there's going to be a great nation that's come for you. Well, that's good, God. I can't even get my wife pregnant. This is God who does these things, and Moses is recognizing these things. I don't have the ability to do these things. I can't carry them in my bosom like you do. I can't nurse them. I can't bring them to the land. I can't do this. And you can hear his inability coming out of this. He's overwhelmed. And yet there's great truth here, isn't there? I I think what fascinated me the most out of verse 12 is the feminine aspect. I gotta say this right. Of God here. Genesis 127 says that God created a male and female. He made them in his image. Let us make them in our image, male and female. And these terms here point to a God who conceives people who births them, who carries them, who nurses them, and brings them all the way to the promised land where the Father is. <laughs> That's an astounding statement, isn't it? Sometimes we think, oh, we, we have our theology so great back now, you know, we've been all this time, we're New Testament, New Covenant, we all this stuff, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's an incredible theology. God does these things. I think it also, men and women in this room, it begins to let you know that God wants gender. He uses gender to point to himself. He teaches his character of himself through these. And if we give up on this battle, if we don't die on this hill, we rob God of his glory. And it's such an important thing. Both male and female exalt the character of God. And I saw this in this passage today, and I just said, oh, Lord, what a... I I just never saw that before. I thought, Lord, I'm so encouraged by that. And I know Moses is on this divine rant right now, and he's upset, and he's overwhelmed, and he's he's complaining nature has gone through the nation, and it's just a mess, and already some people have died on the outskirts, and more are going to die here before I get done with this passage. And he's overwhelmed, but he comes to God and he pours out truth back to God. That's the difference. And that's why I think God hears them. I think as I look at these verses 12 through 14, there's these 
rhetorical questions that point to this conception and birth and provision of the people that only God can do. He says in verse 13, where am I to get meat for all these people? For they weep before me, saying, give me meat that we may eat. I am alone, and I am not able to carry all these people because it is too burdensome for me. It just points to the fact that no human can replace our God and Savior. He is the only one that can take us through the most difficult and trying times. I think Paul speaks this way a little bit. Look at 1 Thessalonians. My thoughts ran to this passage. And I think there's good messages for us as shepherds, those are elders that are here, or, or maybe you're shepherding your home, or you're, or you're um, caring for some souls in some way. There's great lessons here. Paul uses this, some feminine terms here to talk about care of others, right? 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 7, but we prove to be gentle among you. As nursing mothers tenderly care for their own children. I think that's the character of God. Men, certainly there's time to lead. There's times to say, hey, we're doing this. We put our foot down. This is what the Bible says. But there's a gentleness to leadership of carrying them. There's a gentleness to those who lead the homes. And here, Paul is referring to the church. He says, look, we, we handle you like a nursing mother who tenderly cares. What, a, what, what an illustration. Verse 8, having so fond an affection for you. I don't know about you. I don't even don't say those terms to other men. But he said it. We were so well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but our own lives. We, we lay down our own lives for you because... You become so very dear to us. For you recall, brethren, our labor and our hardship, how working night and day, so not to be a burden to any of you, we proclaim the gospel of God. You are the witness, and so is God, how devoutly and upright and blameless we behaved towards you believers, just as you know how we are exhorting and encouraging, imploring each of you as a father with his own children. So now he brings in the masculine side, Right? I think he's learned this from God. So that you would not walk in a manner, you would walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. What a great statement. So I think as I looked at this, I realized how profound Moses and here the Apostle Paul, their understanding of the heart of God towards his people is. He had a deep love and has a deep love for his people. God does. Now, one of the keys here is that these events tell us that Moses is not disregarding his responsibility for these people. But here's, here's what I think he's doing. I had to think on this a long time. As much as he's pleading with God to provide for Israel, he knows he can't. And so I think there's a clear recognition by Moses that he neither can redeem them, sustain them, provide for them, lead them into the promised land like God can. And notice what he says in verse 15. I think this drives us home. So that if you are going to deal with me, he's talking to God still, Moses, please kill me at once. If I found favor in your sight and do not let me see my wretchedness. You know, Scott, what does that mean? Well, here's what I believe Moses is saying. I can't do what only you can do. So if you're asking me to do what only you can do, Kill me. In fact, if I've really found favor in your sight, take me home to be with you and don't let me see my utter failings in trying to do what only you can do. I think that's what he's saying. It's total dependence on God in an extremely difficult situation. Moses is a great example for all of us. I can't do what you do, God. I need you. And if you're, not, if you're going to have me do what only you can do, just kill me. Anybody ever thought that? <laughs> Take me home, Lord. The Bible says that God and Moses were in agreement here. I think they're in agreement here. And there's, there's, no, 
There's no ill consequences to Moses' divine rant here. Not like we see when he strikes the rock and takes the authority away from God later and doesn't allow it to go in the promised land. But God doesn't do that. God just responds now to his request. And that's our fourth point. God's divine response to Moses' plea. Look at verses 16 through 24. Let me start with the first two verses, 16 and 17. The Lord therefore said to Moses, Gather to me 70 men from the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders. It's interesting. Whom you know. You, there, there's a character recognition there. Elders of the people and their officers, and bring them to the tent of meetings, and let them take their stand therefore with you. And then I will come down and I will speak with you there, and I will take of the Spirit who is upon you, and I will put it upon them, and they shall bear the burden of the people with you so that you will not bear it alone. First, the Lord now responds to Moses' plea here in his inability to burden these people alone here. But there's, there's a difference between Moses and the people. Moses is petitioning God for help. The people are still complaining. Moses is coming to God in a different way, Right? They're complaining. Moses is seeking help. He's seeking guidance. How do I do this? I can't do your job. How am I going to get through this? And so the provision for help for Moses is, notice it's gracious and it's generous. He didn't just say, well, you know, I got Joshua. He's coming along. He's a young lad. But you're going to get him in time. Just hold on. He gives him 70 men. That he says, I'm going to take the spirit the divine spirit of God that I've anointed on you, and I'm going to take that spirit and put it on them, and they're going to help carry this burden. This is the graciousness of God, isn't it? Now notice that God's divine response to the people's complaining spirit was very different. Look at verses 18 through 20. Say to the people, consecrate yourself for tomorrow. Uh Uh-oh, wait a minute, there's a religious aspect to this. Set yourself apart now. I'm coming to do something. And you shall eat meat. For you have wept in the ears of the Lord, saying, Oh, that someone would give us meat to eat, for we were well off in Egypt. The Lord is repeating back to them what they said. He's listened to everything they said. Be careful when we complain, don't we? The Lord's listening. Therefore, the Lord will give you meat, and you shall eat. And you shall eat not one day, not two days, not five days, not ten days, not twenty days, but a whole month until it comes out your nostrils, becomes loathsome to you, because you have rejected the Lord who is among you, and you have wept before him, saying, why did we ever leave Egypt? Man, is he bringing it home. I've heard everything you said. And I'm about ready to act. There's a real double-edged sword here, right? There's a provision of food for this ungrateful nation. But you can see that they're craving for meat would be satisfied, but that satisfaction would actually be an expression of judgment from God upon them. You want meat? I'll give you meat. Notice verse 21. We've got to keep moving here. But Moses said, the people among whom I am, Moses is still, he's still wrestling, right? Are 600 on the foot, right? Those are the soldiers counted in chapter 2, right? The men that could go to war 20 years and older or 25, 20 years and older. Um, so, you know, this is 2 million people. And yet you have said, I will give them meat so that they may eat for a whole month. He goes, should the flocks and herds be slaughtered for them to be sufficient for them? Or should all the fish of the sea be gathered together uh, for them be sufficient for them? These are rhetorical questions. No, we don't have enough meat in us to do, uh, do a month here. There's not enough fish And I think what the Lord is doing here, though Moses is lacking the understanding of the coming miraculous event that will be displayed, that he says, look, I understand you can't do this, but I can. And he's teaching Moses that lesson. Step back a little bit. Look at verse 23. And the Lord said to Moses, is the Lord's power limited? Oh, I got that all marked up in my Bible. I hope you do too. Is the Lord's power limited? We act like it is some days, don't we? Then he says this, Now you shall see whether my word will come true for you or not. I think what verse 23 is saying, You have already admitted that you are not me. 
So step aside and watch the power of my word come true. (laughs) I imagine Moses goes, okay, God. I get it. Verse 24, so Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord. And also he gathered the 70 men of the elders of the people and stationed them around the tent. Even though Moses wrestled with God's divine plan and even had questions of how it was all going to be carried out, ultimately what Moses does is he believes God and he carries out the message. He obeys. Look, brothers and sisters, there's times that we just have to say, I know what God wants. I'm just going to go do it. Lord, help me have a right heart. And I think that's what Moses does. He doesn't have all the answers to how he's going to do it. He just said, God said, step aside, I'm going to do this. Number five, the Spirit's visible proof that God will provide. We find this in 25 through 30. Notice that the elders are appointed and they're receiving the anointing of the Spirit here. And then there's this prophesy going on. Look at verse 25. This is an interesting text. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I think it links a little bit into 1 Corinthians and so forth. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him, and he took the spirit who was upon him and placed it upon the 70 elders. And the spirit rested upon them, and they prophesied, but they did not do it again. Well, here now these 70 men are prophesying. I think that's evidence of the gift that they had received like God promised he would do. And in much like the New Testament, they're speaking in, I think much like what the New Testament did prophesying and speaking in tongues, there, there is, there's this extraordinary event happening, though it's, though it's not going to last very long, right? And I think that's what happens in the New Testament. God Use some amazing things where men spoke in tongues, languages. We know that word, right? And they were prophesying, and all this was done before the completion of the scriptures. But I think here, just like the New Testament, this event was a one-time manifestation, and that's what it says at the end of verse 25, doesn't it? But they didn't do it again. So God is showing his miraculous power in this event. I, I read quite a few people on this to get my mind around it and came upon Kyle and Delage, and this is what they said. They said this, the miraculous manifestation of the Spirit was intended to supply, intended simply to give the whole nation a visible proof that God had endowed them with his Spirit as helpers of Moses and had given them the authority required for the exercise of the calling. So he was showing what he could do. He could Show the whole nation that I can put my spirit into these people just like I did Moses. Now, look at verses 26 through 28. There's an event that goes on here. But two men had remained in the camp. The name of one was Eldad and the other name was Medad. The spirit rested upon them. Now they, now they were among those who had been registered but had not gone to the tent. They didn't go to the tabernacle and they were prophesying in the camp. So a young man ran and told Moses and said, Edad and Medad are prophesied in the camp. Then Joshua, the son of Nun, the attendant of Moses, from his youth said, Moses, my Lord, restrain them. (laughs) So here we have this very interesting incident that's happening here in relationship to these 70 anointed elders here. Two of them, they didn't come to the tabernacle, the tent meeting. They stayed out in the camp. Um, some, some people I read said, well, maybe they were unclean, but the Bible doesn't tell us, right? We don't know why they're not there. But nevertheless, these two men are Eldad and Medad, and clearly they've received this gift of the Spirit, and they're prophesying within the camp. But Joshua, Moses' young apprentice here, he's bothered by that these two men would seem to be doing something that would rob Moses of his authority. And I think Joshua's motives were probably honorable, right? He sought to protect the authority of Moses. But Moses refused. He refused to to not recognize what the Spirit was was doing. And 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 he didn't give in to the jealousy of his authority here. So Moses sees great value of what's happening here. Notice what he says in verse 29. Moses said to him, are, are you jealous for my sake? Are you, are you worried about my authority? Look what God's doing. That all, I, he, uh, would, that all the people were prophets that the Lord 
would put his spirit upon them. Now we start to see why God is not displeased with Moses. He has pure goals for these people. He wants them to know God like he knows God. He wants them to be jealous for God, to, to be fervent for God. He, he desires all that. He's, in fact, I think why he says this is he sees that's the problem here. They're not zealous for God. They're zealous for themselves, and that's the problem we're in. And oh, if they would be that way, Joshua, you don't understand this isn't about me. This is about the nation following God. And then Moses returned to the camp, both he and the elders. Now, I just want to affirm something. Again, there's no completed canon. And I, I, this passage is a passage, unfortunately, the hyper-charismatic people love to run to and say, oh, yeah, I see, this is why we do this. It's a one-time event. And most importantly, there's no evidence that these two men actually believed in God. And you go, how do you know that, Scott? Because Joshua and Caleb are the only ones that go into the promised land. These dudes die in the wilderness. Is that, would that be right? Only people we see go in are Joshua and Caleb. The rest of them die off. So it, it tells you that there are people who God may raise up to do something, particularly in this area, and I know this is difficult to get your mind around, but ultimately may still reject the word of God. Balaam is the one. We, we'll see him shortly here. Last thought. And this one, a little tongue-in-cheek here. A bird's-eye view of death of the greedy. I hope you get this. These verses now pick up the story that left off in 18 where God says, I'm going to send meat, and I'm going to let their greedy desires bring on a plague. Verse 31, notice he says, Now they went for, there went forth a wind from the Lord, and it brought quail from the sea, and let them fall behind, uh, beside the camp. About a day's journey on this side, and a day's journey on the other side, all around the camp, about two cubits deep on the surface of the ground. The people spent all day and all night and all the next day and gathered the quail. He who gathered the least gathered ten homers, and they spread them out for themselves all around the camp. Quail were known even to this day to migrate in this area. In spring, they go south to north, and in fall, they go back north to south. I actually saw quail on the Mount, suppose of Mount Sinai, I saw two different, two, two of them. And you can't miss quail because when they take off their wings, beat, you know, that noise. If you've ever hunted quail or seen a brrr, I mean, oh, wow, there was a quail. It was pretty cool. Um, but this, this is enormous, right? This is enormous coveys. Um, and they've recorded big coveys that are in this area at times when they're migrating. But this is extraordinary, right? And the birds will come across the Sinai Plain. They'll tell you all this. They come across the Sinai Plain. And they usually rest in that area. And a lot of people try to use this as well. God just used natural circumstances to, uh, to provide for his people. Well, yes and no. This is miraculous. The Bible says this. Notice in verse 31. There went forth a wind from the Lord. <laughs> and he brought the quail from the sea. So this isn't just like, well, you know, just something has happened. They, right, right time, right place. Hey, great, glad it all worked out. This is God doing this. And the fact that this event is, uh, it occurs here and is written down teaches us that God was divine and miraculous in his work here. And it's he who prepared this enormous meal for this complaining people. Now, notice it says two cubits. There's disagreements whether it means that they flew this like three feet off the ground or the quail were three feet deep. I kind of lean towards the end. I think they were deep in quail. But whatever the case, no one gathered less than 10 homers. Now, I hadn't looked that up. Um, this would be somewhere today between three to seven bushels. One bushel, if you do it in gallons, is almost nine and a half gallons, or one and a quarter cubic feet of quail meat. <laughs> this is a lot of meat. It makes me hungry. I love quail. If you have not eaten quail, it's pretty fun. It's just a great meat. But that's precisely the point. This is unbelievable, right? Because that's what God does. He sends this massive quail group there. Now, notice the people spread the birds out on the ground. It says in verse 32. And so what I think they're doing there is they're drying the meat and preserving probably salt in it because that's no refrigeration, right? So they're, they're getting ready for this, right? And now they're readying their tables. They're readying this feast. And look at verse 33. While the meat was still between their teeth, before it was chewed, the anger of the Lord was kindled against the people, and the Lord struck the people with a very severe plague. 
All of a sudden, this feast turns into a horror scene. This is, this is bad. Before the people could get their teeth sunk into this meat, God strikes them. Notice the language at the end of verse 33 with a very severe plague. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us what happened here and what that it was, but all we know is a large number of them fell dead. And now, here we, remember the title of the sermon, there's another graveyard on the way to the promised land because of this complaining spirit. In fact, the Bible tells us that they name the place after this. Verse 34, now the name of the place with Kilbroth, I can't pronounce that last one, because they, were, they buried the people who, were, who had been greedy. They named the place after their greed. Now, I want to just finish with this. The psalmist picks up on this. And, and listen, and you might want to turn there because it's worth looking at this. Psalm 78, 27 through 34. Israel remembers this. And even in their times, most likely under King David and Solomon, uh, the psalmist, and we're not sure who this psalmist is, I think in this one, uh, but they write of this. They remember these things. Psalms 78, 27 is where I'm at. Follow along. When he, when he God, rained meat upon them like the dust. That'll give you a little bit of view of this. A dust storm of meat. Sounds pretty good in one way. <laughs> Even winged fowl like the sands of the sea. The psalmist is now explaining how many. That's why I think it's probably three feet deep versus flying three feet. Then he let them fall in the midst of the camp. He let them. The psalmist is acknowledging God brings them into the camp. Around about their dwellings. A mile to the left, mile to the right, right? So that they ate and were filled in their desires he gave to them. Before they had satisfied their desires while their food was in their mouth, the anger of the Lord rose against them and killed some of their stoutest ones and subdued the choice men of Israel. So we're getting a little more understanding of what happens in this narrative in, in Numbers 11. And the anger of the Lord rose against them and killed some of these stoutest ones and subdued the choice men. In spite of all of this, they still sinned. That's what chapter 12 is about. And they did not believe in the wonderful works of God, right? So he brought their days to an end in futility and their years in sudden terror. Remember I said that all of a sudden this went from a feast to a horror show? When he killed them. And then they sought him and returned and searched diligently for God. Psalmist in Psalms 106 also brings us up 13 through 15. They quickly forgot his works. They did not wait for his counsel, but craved intensely in the wilderness. That goes back to that desire, right? That craving desires they had there. And tempted God in the desert, so he gave them their request. No, this verse helps you understand what happened. But sent a wasting disease among them. You know what wasting disease is? gets to the brain. It's, we see it in animals all the time. There's a wasting disease going on in the snow geese out west. My son Connor was just telling me, he goes, Dad, there's a snow geese walking around. You just walk right up to them. They're all goofy. It gets into elk and deer and these wasting disease. And they gotta, they got to kill them off because it just gets into the next flock. It's a terrible way to die. And the psalmist, at least, tells us that God gave them a west, wasting disease and they died a terrible death. It... it, it it's sobering to think of the graveyards of the faithless on the way to the promised land. And look, I, I, I know this is maybe not the most uplifting <laughs> message, but I'm doing my best with what the Lord gives me in chapter 11. There are always people who faith, faithlessly hang around religion. I pray you're not one of those. I pray your faith is in Jesus Christ alone, that you have nothing I pray that you're like Moses where you say, God, I cannot do what you do. I am fully dependent on you to rescue me and bring me home to be with you. I think that's the goal here. And I think that's where Moses got. He said, I, I can't do this. What a great thing. Is that what you said when you got saved? I can't do this, Lord. My sin is too great. I, I, can't, I can't save myself. I'm utterly dependent upon your son's work. Hmm.
It's a good place to be right there, right? And we see our God is loving, right? He, he dwells with them. He feeds them. He cares for them. He protects them. He does all that. Let's be faithful people because of the gospel. Jesus, thank you for your love for us. Thank you that you came in despite what man did to you. And as the song says, we can hear our mocking voices crying out the crowd, so we're, we're not guiltless here, Lord. But despite all of that, you went to the cross at a specific time, place that God had determined for you to die on this earth. Physically, you were here. And God judged you physically for our sin. And so, Lord, that's a great motivation. You rescued us out of our damnation. You rescued out of our slavery to sin. You have provided for us. Yes, Lord, you do take us through challenging times at times because you're refining us. You're making us more like your son, and we fight that sometimes, Lord, and we ask your forgiveness for those. But Lord, help us put our faith in the one and the only one who can do what we can't do, not only for salvation, but for daily stuff. We need your help, Lord. Thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen.